uh, you're running about six of them, I figure. Just wondered if you had any, uh, you know, profound thoughts about it all. Any special uh, thoughts about a last campaign, maybe a last hurrah, something you've learned from the past you might want to do differently this time, <laughs> lessons learned at work. No, as a matter of fact, I haven't, and I didn't even give it a th thought about the last until uh, uh, working on the speech and reference to the fact that this would be the last time you know, I'd be doing this at a convention. And then for the first, first time it dawned on me, but uh, maybe that's one of the things that goes with my age. It's, uh, uh, no, I haven't any regrets or anything about that. Do you have any special feeling about a final campaign, a last campaign? Just that I hope it'll be successful. Uh, assuming you win, uh, what do you want to really get done in your second term? What's well, George, I think... Your last four years in office. Yeah, well, I think that's... Uh, I keep thinking how similar it is to uh, the second term as governor, that, that uh, I want to follow the pattern that we've laid down. Uh, I want to continue until uh, we have more than a beginning with regard to the uh, economic problems, and which I think can be laid to government, uh, government becoming too big a part of the economy, and to get government uh, down and back to where it is supposed to be, I recognize it has very legitimate functions that it must perform. I think government always, any government as an institution, has a tendency to go beyond those limits and to begin to see other things it thinks it should do without considering whether it is interfering with the natural processes. I want to continue along that line. Uh, do you, cut, do you want to cut back some more? Well, I want to get government down to where I think it is at the most economical level it can get and perform the services that government is supposed to perform. I, over and above that, there are some social uh, things that, I've, uh, that I would like to see government uh, do and in the international area. I'm still determined that we must get a handle on nuclear weapons. I would like to believe that we could eventually get them completely eliminated in the world. You've, you've dealt with three different Soviet leaders, two mm -hmm. of whom have died in office. And you've sent some personal letters, I guess, uh, and gotten uh, press releases back practically. Yeah. Uh, what, tell me a little bit about the frustrations you've had of dealing with with the Kremlin? Well, in some ways, I think they're the ones that are frustrated. They've, uh, you know, three leaders in three years, and they don't have, as we do, uh, a really legitimate way of uh, replacing leadership. And so I think it's, it's caused uh, great traumas there and, uh, and a certain amount of confusion. And that's reflected in their relations with us and other countries. But um, we well, have to find an answer to our problems because the United States and the Soviet Union uh, are the only two that could cause a war. And we're not going to cause a war. And therefore, uh, I look forward to being able to meet with them to if they are fearful of us, and, and really fearful, not just to put on, I would like to do what could be done to eliminate uh, that fear and, and prove to them that we have no designs on anyone. And at the same time, uh, if that's mixed up with uh, their philosophy of a world revolution and their eventual domination, to um, let them know that that is the threat to world peace. When do you think you can meet with them? Uh, well, I would assume that if there is a second administration uh, or second term, uh, uh, that it could be sometime in that. We've well, announced our about? willingness to, to meet with them before, but it appears that, uh, that that's growing less likely. Mm -hmm. How early in a second term do you think that you can meet with the Soviet leader? Well, I feel about that the same as I feel about right now, that uh, uh, we're ready any time and, and for any place. 
do you expect to put out any special effort or anything or once uh, re elected to? Uh, we haven't gotten much credit for it, but that's what we've been doing is putting out special effort. We have really been working at this. Uh, well, with the constant relations that we have, uh, uh, diplomatic relations with the, uh, look, we have, we have actually proposed uh, a great number of agreements to them, and some have now been recognized, but they range all the way from the major arms uh, negotiations, and we are in negotiations with them in, in two places. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, chemical weapons, the, uh, the testing, the uh, space, all of these things, uh, we have finally worked out with them, something we started with almost when we first came here. Uh, that was the agreement on, on a better hotline system to further reduce the possibility of accident and finally have agreement with them on that. So uh, this thing that so many people seem to uh, indicate that we're sitting back uh, doing nothing and waiting for something, no, we have been we're the ones that proposed the meetings. We're the ones that have proposed reductions of arms. When we went for total elimination of intermediate range weapons in, uh, in Europe, and uh, they were totally unwilling to do that, we said, all right, then are you willing to sit down and we can start negotiating about, say, at least a reduced number mm -hmm. of them? And they sat down at that and then walked out. Well, is this personally frustrating for you to try to, to work out a personal relationship with these people? And oh, there's, there's bound to be some frustration with it, and yet uh, it isn't totally unexpected. I've, uh, I've had a, well, I think I've been something of a student of uh, international relations uh, where our two countries are concerned for many years, even before I became governor. And I remember when some of your fraternity uh, when I was running for governor, said that if I didn't stop thinking about international problems and start thinking about domestic California problems, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be governor. Let me ask a question that's difficult to ask, but more and more now, columnists and TV commentators are, writing, are talking about your age mm -hmm. and saying that you may not be able to make it to a second term on all cylinders. That uh, that you you may be physically well, but mentally you may be slipping. <laughs> now, what you know, what what assurance do the American people have that that's not true? And how? Do, what do you say about that? Well, it's pretty hard to assure the American people if the means of communication, meaning the media, uh, have through some kind of journalistic incest, uh, decided uh, to gang up on that subject. Now let me give a classic example very recently of um, something that has appeared not once but several times by different writers in different forms of the media. The opening of the Olympics. Aha, they used an example that I couldn't even memorize the couple of sentences of the official statement opening the Olympics. Well, that's absolutely false. I looked at the statement sitting up there in the press box at the Coliseum and the line that I thought was the principal line they had first, and then some just further uh, words about the Olympics generally to follow it. The first, that they had first the line, I hereby declare these games mm -hmm. are open. And Mr. Uberoth was there beside me, and I said, do I have your permission to <clears throat> switch these two lines? And uh, he kind of looked a question at me before he answered, and I said, I think the applause line you have first. Mm. <laughs> and I said, I think if it was, that's the big line, that's the one that should close, whatever I say. He agreed immediately, he said, fine, go ahead. So I switched the two lines. And then it took, uh, oh, it took a week or two, it seems, uh, before suddenly I was reading that I couldn't memorize those, those two sentences. But there's reports that you doze off during cabinet meetings. Uh, and, uh, I think Mike, when he was talking that, was trying to say, and what he did say, that there are some meetings in which, uh, uh, particularly if you're suffering a time lapse, uh, jet lag, you know, if you're someplace uh, where you're off your schedule, that you kind of have to battle to, to stay with the meeting. 
I've had a lot of experience in that. In those four trips for President Nixon, uh, three to Asia and one to several countries in Europe, where immediately after landing with 10 hours time difference, you find yourself sitting with the head of state uh, and dealing with him. But uh, I think enough number of people have said since that they've never seen me asleep in a in a meeting and Do you have, uh, have trouble uh, keeping awake sometimes no the, the problem is uh, uh, is the other way if you were interviewing Nancy she'd tell you that um, she is uh, like a dutiful mother she is always after me to take naps I can't take naps didn't I don't sleep on the airplane I, or when we're traveling didn't you used to take naps uh during well, campaigns and things like that? No. Before. The only time I took naps was right after, uh, right after the shooting in March mm -hmm. of 81, and uh, when I was recovering from that. And uh, that all disappeared uh, when I was finally recovered. When somebody asked you about this four years ago, a New York Times writer, uh, you said that you would take tests some sort of oh. test of the, you know. Well, no, I, I said that I took these annual physical examinations, and if I ever thought that, and the result of one of those, that uh, I was not capable of performing the job, but I said at the same time, I, I think I would be the first to know if I had uh, lost a capability to reason or to think, and uh, uh, if so, I would, obviously I would step down. Let me ask you about some of these social issues that you'd like to get done in the second term. You, you seem to be talking more about religion in the last few months, the last couple of years, than uh, I remember you years ago. And is that because, because you've become more religious or you think that it's uh, more acceptable politically now or more popular? Or, or why is that? No, I'm certainly not more religious than I was. Uh, I was raised that way and to have a very great faith, and I do. Um, like with many people, and most people, it was for a time not having been in this kind of public life, it was difficult for me to, uh, to talk about something that was so personal with me. But in public life, I feel there's a responsibility uh, with regard to moral issues, as well as whether you're going to raise or not raise the taxes and so forth. And so I think it, is, uh, it has come to be that I have overcome that uh, personal uh, privatization, if you will, and felt that I have a responsibility to talk in this. And I don't know that I made it the issue. I think also what has happened in these years has been what I spoke of this morning, the, uh, the very busy uh, activity of, of some people who are trying to so secularize government uh, that uh, we literally would have uh, not freedom of religion, meaning the protection by government of religion, but that we would have uh, uh, government an adversary of religion. Let me ask you, what do you want your legacy to be? I mean, that's a question I'm sure everybody asks, but you've got four years left, assuming you're reelected in public office. What do, you, uh -huh. what do you want people to remember you for particularly? And, or, and conversely, not what don't you want to be I mean, remembered? Well, what failure that do you want to escape? Well, just failure to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. What I would like to see accomplished, and. Uh, if there's going to be any remembering, the remembered for is that I preserved or helped the people preserve and where necessary restore the original concept of this government and this country, which was limited government, the utmost, the ultimate in individual freedom and government retained at the levels closest to the people to the furthest extent possible. The great secret of our freedom all these 200 years has been that we are a federation of sovereign states and that within the state 
the community, the things that are of immediate interest to the people, the education of their children, things of that kind, those are decided at the community level. Then those that recall brought, brought her at the state. The federal government was to be the protector of our national security from outside forces and all. It had a number of things that the federal government should do and does very well. Um, those things that cross state lines and that become a multiple problem are for the federal government. But we did go through a long period when the federal government was usurping power and authority that were never intended for it. You think it still is? Well, we haven't, we haven't eliminated it to the extent possible. This is why I started the program called Federalism. But let me give you one example. In 1932, when I cast my first vote as a Democrat uh, for a party that then was campaigning for a return to states and local communities of authority they said had been unjustly seized by the federal government. At that time, the governments of the United States were taking a dime out of every dollar earned. Total governments. Mm -hmm. And only a third of that paid for the federal government. Two thirds did all the things at the state and local level and kept the schools and did all the things that we needed. Well, today, we're up far above that. Uh, we're well above a third, and, and sometimes it seems like gonna go halfway, but two-thirds of that now, that bigger amount, is going to the federal government, and only one-third is going to the states and the local communities. By your, by your answer, it would seem that that would supersede uh, an arms agreement or a continued peace with the Soviets oh, no. on your no, priority list. No, because remember, the first primary function of the federal government is the national security. And that's why, strangely enough, with all of the attack on our defense budgeting, it seems strange to me because historically, national defense was approaching half of the national budget, the federal budget. Well, ours is only about 26 or 27 percent of the federal budget. And yet suddenly there's this great furor and this uproar that we're, uh, that we somehow are, have gone way overboard in a direction that this country has never taken. You've got this terrible George deficit. Nice. Okay. You've got this terrible deficit facing you. Yeah. I mean, how committed are you to getting that thing down? Oh, I've been committed for 30 years. You know, but, uh, but it's going up. All right, yes. It's a little bit like guns and butter. Isn't yes, it? just the same as the size of government has been inevitably rising and all. We have not been able to turn that to a decline yet. We have been able to have the rate of increase. But these things that were built in, and then when you have a recession, with the programs that we have, and no one wants to do away with them, of unemployment insurance and food stamps and so forth, you increase the outgo in a recession at the same time you decrease the revenue because of the people that are now no longer paying taxes but are actually getting uh, support from the government. But here again, the deficit, yes, it's a tremendous figure. But for 50 years, ever since the New Deal started, the policy of the opposing party has been one that deficits were no problem. And they, but, you're, they, but you're in charge now. Yes. I'm in charge, except there isn't one line in the Constitution that says a president can spend a nickel. The spending is dictated by the Congress. And for the 20 years since World War II that there have been Republican presidents, for 14 of those 20 years, Republican presidents have had a Congress that both houses were controlled by the Democratic Party. And for an additional four years, they have had, uh, we have had uh, one house of the Congress, but they have still had the People's House, the, the House of Representatives. I think it would be interesting once there was only two years that a Republican president out of these 20 had a Republican Congress. That was two years of Dwight Eisenhower. And incidentally, inflation didn't go up a penny during you, that time. But now let, let me just finish on the deficit, though. We, you know, they, 
the old saying, uh, figures don't lie, but liars can figure. It depends on, on whether you, you're going to now determine it by the number of dollars. It is not all that horrendous if you look at it from the standpoint of what percentage is it of the gross national product. Because at the same time that the deficit is up, the whole gross national product is up. And that's the ratio that has to be figured. It's like when so many of you assailed me a couple of years ago when there was a 36 point drop in the stock market. And you said it was the greatest drop since 1929, the big crash, when it dropped 38 points. But no pointed out, one pointed out that when it dropped 38 points in 1929, the Dow Jones average was only 200. When it dropped 36 points in our administration, the Dow Jones was over 1,000. Uh, 36 is not as big a percentage of, as that. The same is true of, of the deficit. But we're going to, with growth in the economy, look, last year, the deficit was $195 billion. It's more than $21 billion less already in the estimate for this year. Growth in the economy, further reductions of spending, and not, as our opponents say, uh, eliminating total programs that government possibly should perform. No. Taxes? The federal got no, the federal government has the highest ratio of overhead of any institution in the country. Local government can develop a dollar's worth of services or can deliver a dollar's worth of services to the people for only a fraction of a dollar. At the state level, as government gets bigger, it takes about twice as much to deliver a dollar. At the federal level, usually it takes more than a dollar in overhand to deliver a dollar uh, to the people. And I just happen to believe that government can be made more efficient, more economical, and probably end up performing the services better. This is why we're studying the 2000 478 recommendations of the Grace Commission. All of them are aimed at how can business be made, or government be made more businesslike. He wants to get another interview. Oh, all right.